Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'll be attempting to platinum 10 games within 10 days. Now, credit where credit is due, this video is heavily inspired from Mystic's 30 Platinums in 30 Days video. I've seen a few other people attempt this challenge as well, and I thought it was about time I gave this challenge a go for myself. When starting to plan out this video, I knew 30 days would be impossible for me, as I didn't have that much spare time on my hands, so I opted for a much smaller but still challenging 10 days instead. After that, I decided I need to give myself a few ground rules so that this challenge could actually be possible. The first rule I decided on was to allow myself to platinum one PS Vita game. Now, I instantly know what you're thinking, but this was because I knew I wouldn't be free 24-7, so being able to earn a platinum on the go allowed me to make up for lost time. The second rule was no super easy platinums. I wanted this video to be challenging, and games like these just invalidate the challenge altogether. And the third and final ground rule is the games have to be at least 4-5 to five hours long and a maximum of 10 hours. This is more of a choice on my behalf because the predicted times on PSN profiles are never correct and a 10 hour platinum can easily become a 15 hour platinum depending on the person. Now that you're all caught up on the basics of the challenge, I think it's about time we start earning some platinums. The official start time of the challenge will be 10.48am on Friday the 13th of January and the game in question will be Little Nightmares 2. I had originally played the first one a few years back and after completing it, it kind of faded away to the back of my mind. I was a bit skeptical jumping into this one, but I have to say this game actually surprised me a lot. A few minutes after starting the story, we find the first of many glitched remains. These are one of the collectibles you can find while playing the game and they're usually hidden in certain areas like this one. Basically straight after this, we also find the second type of collectible, hats. The cool thing about hats is that there are certain types of trophies linked to doing certain things while wearing them. This means that they're not just useless collectibles like most other games, but actually warrant a reason to wear them. Now, to earn our first trophy in the game, I had to get through this first chapter without dying. Using these acorns, I could throw them onto the leaves and trigger the traps, allowing me to jump over unharmed, earning me the first trophy of the game, Evasive Prey. We then get the trophy what's in the box for opening the fridge. And a little while after this, we get the trophies at 26 for calling 6 26 times. And in the palm of my hands for holding 6's hand for 6 minutes. Eventually, we get into an altercation with the grumpy farmer who wants to shoot us because I'm wearing the same outfit as him. To calm him down, I changed my hat and shot him point blank to earn the trophy fair prey. Once we make our way to the school, there's another hat specific trophy that requires you to wear a football and run through the goal, earning the trophy referee. Once inside, Six gets stolen by a bunch of bullies and I can only assume this is because she didn't subscribe to the channel. To get Six back, we have to put a bunch of bullies to sleep. There's actually a trophy for taking out a whole classroom of bullies, which I got accidentally while ending my life in the process. This chapter was going great until for some reason the game glitched on me and the bullies became invincible. We ended up getting six back though and we made our way through one of the many beautiful parts of this game. Around this area was also the last glitch remaining of the chapter which unlocked this trophy. After collecting this teddy bear hat for the trophy half hat, I put it straight on grabbed the teddy bear on the floor and ran down to the elevator, where the teddy bear would meet its fate for the trophy Toys Are For Kids. I honestly thought this chapter was quite good. There's a decent amount of miscellaneous trophies within this chapter, and there's also a really cool part where you run for a bunch of mannequins, and they'll only stop if you shine a light on them. Once it was over though, I grabbed the last glitch remaining of the chapter for another trophy. And then I threw a medicine ball at the mannequins to keep them at bay. There was a few more cool scenes that I captured before grabbing the last glitch remaining of the whole game to earn the trophy No More Remains. This fight was really visually pleasing and after a few tries of understanding how exactly to defeat the guy, one of the few remaining trophies popped. All that was left to do was to have the final fight with Six, hit her music box a few times and bring her back to normality, which pops the final two trophies in the main game. 
To obtain the Platinum, the last achievement required you to equip a hat only obtainable when beating the game. So the plan for day two was to start my Vita lifeline, as I was going to be busy over the weekend. The game of choice? The Walking Dead Season 1. This game is a classic and I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of people watching this video at some point have played this game, whether it be on the Vita as I'm doing right now, or on the many console generations it's been playable on. What I'm trying to say is this game needs no introduction. The reason for choosing this game was because the Vita had no built-in recording feature, meaning that I couldn't record the trophies as they were earned. The good thing about playing The Walking Dead is that the trophies are quite generic and linear, so there's not really any missable trophies to miss. I still tried my best to record when I could, but ultimately ended up scrapping the idea entirely. What I decided to do instead was to show the trophies I had earned on a set day using PSN profiles. The first episode is great, as is the whole season, but I feel like the first episode is always the more memorable one. It's the episode where you meet Clementine, Kenny, and also where you make your first split decision, deciding on whether to save Doug or Carly, and ultimately ending in the motel before the unfortunate events of episode 2. As day two drew to a close, I had finished episode one and earned all eight trophies related to the chapters. The goal for day three was to complete episode two of The Walking Dead, but this didn't really go to plan. I got decently far into the first couple chapters, meeting the very welcoming farmers and sorting the electric fence out. I found Clementine's hat when looking around with Mark, who ends up shooting this woman as she's about to expose who he really is. But that's as far as I got, day three and only three trophies. By day four, I was kind of getting stressed. I was only four days in and only one platinum to show for it. This meant that with only six days left, I needed to get nine platinums and I genuinely wasn't too sure it would be possible. I decided it was time to play a game I had been keeping in my backlog for an extremely long time. I had heard great things about this game and I thought it was about time to check it out for myself and what a great decision that was. This game really got me hooked. I played the whole day non-stop and enjoyed pretty much every minute of it. The game starts out in Sandover Village. We have to complete tasks in order to receive power cells. One of the first trophies we earn is for rounding up a bunch of bulls in order to receive this power cell. A bit later on, you have to connect all the towers to create power in order to get another power cell from this guy which inevitably gets you another trophy. In the same area, there's a guy wanting you to collect 200 fish in order to receive a power cell. No matter what I try, I can't seem to catch a single fish in this river. Woo! Maybe it's your breath. You're not allowed to miss 20 fish and you can't grab the purple ones or else you fail. After a few attempts, I was pretty sure I had it. I was so close to getting it and then I failed. It only took me a few more attempts to finally get the 200 fish, which earned us the power cell and more importantly, the trophy. After defeating the first boss and grabbing the trophy, we managed to grab all the orbs within the Forbidden Jungle. I ended up grabbing all the orbs for Sentinel Beach, Misty Island and Sandover Village too, before trying my luck at the trophy Izum. Yeah, let's just say this took a few tries. I eventually got lucky and made it to the end, finally earning the trophy. It was pretty much a rinse and repeat from here on out. The game is really, really good, but once you complete the first area, you can kind of see how the game's going to play. I will say though, a couple trophies still managed to stop me in my tracks. For this one, you have to complete a time trial by going through these purple checkpoints. The game's pretty lenient with the time in between each checkpoint, but it's kind of hard to know where the next checkpoint is going to be, so I had to replay it a few times. In the same area, there's a trophy for getting rid of all of these plants. It seems simple enough, but there's a time limit before they pop back up again, so you have to be quick. It also doesn't help that the stuff you're using to remove the plants has a time limit too, so by the time you've restocked, they're already back. Nearer the end of the game, there's this one area that really gave me a hard time, the spider cave. This level was single-handedly the only bad experience I had while playing this game. I died a bunch of times due to the double jump not working properly. I also had the constant worry of accidentally missing a few orbs because the majority of them are earned from shooting these worm things on the trees. There were also these crystals you had to shoot in order to get a trophy and a power cell. I originally missed one and honestly, <laughs> I thought about giving up for the night, but I ended up finding the crystal and finally earning the trophy.
all that was left to do now was to reach the end of the lava tube for the trophy zoom 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 and free the red sage the blue sage and the yellow sage this is also where the last scout fly was the last orb and finally the last power cell With only two trophies remaining, I freed the green sage and made my way to the final boss fight, which in all fairness was actually pretty easy. I completed this game in one sitting, <laughs> which is a bit crazy, but I played it for around 10 hours or so and finished at 12.35 a.m. When day five rolled around, it was getting pretty clear that I was falling behind on the challenge and the idea of getting 10 Platinums in 10 days started to seem impossible. If I wanted to finish this challenge, I needed to pick up the rate I was earning these Platinums. And that's exactly what I did. I started day five with a game called Super Liminal. I didn't really know what to expect when jumping into this one, but it was actually kind of fun. The premise of this game is all about illusions, making objects bigger or smaller depending on your needs. The first collectible of the game is a fire alarm. Weird, I know, but flicking the switch gives us this trophy. In the same area, we can get the second type of collectible, blueprints. This one requires you to make a cheese block as big as possible in order to jump over the gap. It was actually kind of hard to get the perspective right but I got lucky and the cheese landed in a way that allowed me to jump over, barely making it to the blueprint. There's a bunch of cool illusions like this one where you have to line everything up perfectly and use the object to move along the level. Or this one that seemingly looks like a dead end but is actually the way forward. Another collectible in this game are fire extinguishers. They are placed all over the game and are usually paired up with fire alarms. We can grab a few more miscellaneous trophies like this one for dropping an apple on your head. Or this one for holding an object for an unspecified amount of time. As I got nearer to the end of the game, I grabbed the final fire extinguisher and grabbed the final blueprint. Isn't it also a place? And then I aligned the final stars. This was the end of the game and only two trophies remained. The last two trophies of the game are called Speedrunner and Superliminal. And as you can probably tell, these are for speedrunning. To get the Platinum, the ideal run would be 35 minutes to achieve both speedrun trophies and the Platinum. But of course, that didn't go to plan. On my first attempt, I managed to complete the game in around 48 minutes, which earned me the first speedrun trophy. I tried and tried and tried again to complete the game in under 35 minutes, but I would always get caught up trying to make the object a certain size. I decided it was time to take a break for a few hours, and when I came back to try again, this happened. I ended up finishing this game at 7.26pm and decided that if I actually wanted a decent shot at completing this challenge, I had to start another game. I decided it was time to start Pumpkin Jack. I actually held off playing this game for quite a while as I didn't think it would be my type of game, but I have to say it was actually quite fun. The trophies are pretty simple, collecting a skull within the first area will net you a trophy, as will getting your first kill. Grabbing this gramophone will earn the trophy Boogeyman, and you'll see why. After this though, it's pretty much a rinse and repeat. There's a few unique boss fights per level, and these bosses can sometimes be challenging. Ideally, I wanted to complete the game by the end of day 5, but it turned out to be a lot longer than I expected. At 4.18am, I had earned exactly 50% of the trophies, and decided it was time to get some rest before starting day 6. Day 6 started off pretty well, and it was actually probably the best day in terms of progress so far. At 11.20am, we were back on Pumpkin Jack. There was only a few trophies left, which didn't take me too long. I had to finish collecting all the skulls for this trophy. I then had to finish collecting all the cool dancing gramophones for this trophy. And after defeating the final boss of the game, I earned this trophy. To obtain the Platinum, I had to purchase the last outfit of the game using the skulls I collected. 
Pumpkin Jack was finished at 1.18 p.m. I decided to take a break before playing probably my least favorite game out of this challenge. I forgot to record the time I had started this game, but I unlocked my first trophy at 5.51 p.m., meaning I probably started a few minutes before that. This game isn't actually that bad, but I just didn't find it enjoyable. The story was a bit all over the place, and the actual concept of the game itself was just not my type of game. I will say though, around this point in the challenge, I was starting to feel a little bit burnt out, which could be the reason why this game didn't necessarily click with me. There's a few collectibles we need to collect within this game, and grabbing this postcard at the start gets us our first collectible trophy. Not. Also pretty close to this one was another collectible type called Echoes. These require you to find a crack on the object, eventually playing a message from the past. I'm here. No, it's definitely something. The only semi-difficult trophy in this game was called Phantom. For this trophy, you have to sneak past this creature without alerting it. It seems easy enough, but it's possible for the creature to see you and not react at all, meaning you could play through the rest of this chapter and only realize you were caught once the trophy doesn't pop. Luckily for us though, the trophy did indeed pop. Love you, bolt cutters. There are a few more miscellaneous trophies like running for two kilometers or inspecting a hundred objects in one playthrough before getting pretty decent to a part of the story where you're being chased by the same creature as before and you switch between realms, being able to see the creature and then coming back to normality and just running aimlessly. Once we escape, there's a trophy called Thunderstruck which requires you to actually electrify the creature. Shut your mouth! After achieving that one, all that was left was to find the last echo Lily. and then stay in spirit mode for 10 minutes. The only thing left to do for the Platinum was to watch this cutscene. And I have to say, out of the whole game, this is probably my favourite cutscene because the game ends. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just joking, but in all honesty, I was glad to finally be done with this game. I finished Medium at 11.36pm and I wasn't too sure whether I wanted to start another game or to head to sleep. But with only 5 Platinums to my name and only 4 days left, I knew that if I wanted an actual shot at completing this challenge, I had to stay up. I had heard great things about this game, and honestly, I believe it single-handedly cured my burnout. This game was great, and it really got me believing that this challenge would actually become possible again. I've always been fascinated with space, and being on the moon, alone, trying to figure out what happened to everyone else, while also being humanity's only shot at life, genuinely sounded like a great game. As soon as the game started, we earned the first trophy for scanning a scannable object. A few minutes after this, we earn a trophy for listening to the first of many audio logs. Audio logs are used to give conversations from the past, which help us piece the story together on our own, which I found really interesting. We then leave Earth in a spaceship that you actually have to control, turning on certain switches and flying past different planets. When landing on the moon, there's a telescope we need for a trophy, and if you look for it long enough, this happens. This is when we can watch the first of many holograms. Holograms are pretty much the same as audio logs in the sense that they show information relating to the story. It's actually quite a unique way of storytelling and I quite liked it. To my surprise, it was actually possible to venture outside onto the moon's surface. This wasn't something I was expecting to be able to do and I actually enjoyed roaming around for a bit. I eventually found the setup for the moon landing, which are not this trophy. This game also has a semi AFK trophy, which requires you to stay outside for 30 minutes. Unlike other AFK trophies, I feel like this one is fairly justified, as there's a decent amount of story related tasks to do out here, and there's also a good view to wrap up the last 10 or so minutes before the trophy pops. A little while after this, we can unlock the trophy Goodbye Old Friend. To earn this trophy, you have to carry this self through a couple areas before ultimately ending up here, where you're required to deploy the space car. Once outside, we can carry this cell over to the spot before running back to the space car and linking the MPT towers for the trophy Twin Flames. After the towers are linked, the area explodes and the cell unfortunately meets its end for the trophy Goodbye Old Friend. As we start to approach the end of the game, we can unlock the trophy Cosmic Traveler for collecting all comics. I have to admit, I forgot to record the comics as they were picked up, so you're just going to have to trust me when I say I grabbed them all. Without the we also listened to the last audio log before popping this trophy. There's also a pretty cool trophy in this area that requires you to collect two rubber ducks. Again, I kind of forgot to record the first duck for whatever reason, but once we collected the second one, the trophy popped. It's our home! Kathy's home! 
And think about Claire. She's made her decision, and I, I can't go back to Earth. But with Kathy and Outwood, there's a, there's a chance to start over a new dawn. We do what we must to keep them safe, even if they don't understand. But we can be wrong, Isaac. You said it yourself. MacArthur's wrong. Sarah! Outward is wrong. Sarah! Everything about this is... <gasps> what? <laughs> I... Straight after this hologram finishes, we can grab the last scannable object for this trophy. There was only a few more trophies left in the game at this point, and honestly, I didn't want it to end. Unfortunately though, all good things must come to an end. After linking the power back to Earth, it was finally time to say goodbye to this game, and what a great ending it was. I ended up earning this platinum trophy at 10 past 4 in the morning and honestly if the game carried on I would have kept playing for a few more hours. From start to finish this game took around four and a half hours which I must admit is on the shorter side of this challenge but it was honestly one of the better games I had played thus far. With six platinums to my name and being back on track to win this challenge again I went to sleep ready for day seven. Now that I had caught up in terms of trophies it meant I could play longer titles and as long as I completed them before the day was up I would still be on track. With that in mind I started day 7 with Concrete Genie. This was another game I had been meaning to play for a good while. A few people had mentioned to me that it was a decent experience gameplay wise and platinum wise so I decided it was time to give it a go. I only realised once starting this game that I had previously earned the first two trophies a few years back which meant I couldn't put them in the video. These are the two trophies in question and they're easily obtainable due to being earned within the first 5 minutes of the game. I would have earned these during my current playthrough but as they were already earned my first official trophy of the playthrough would be for painting 20 stars. If you're curious, this would also be where you'd earn the trophy called Luna's Apprentice and pretty much the same place where you'd earn Colourful Companions as well. So you can see that I didn't really miss out on much by having these already unlocked. A little while after this, we run into the first of many genie moments. These are usually quite hidden and are located by finding the little white drawing on the wall. To complete these moments, the genie will ask for a few specific patterns to be drawn on the wall. And once they're happy, the moment is complete. One for the books. We then get the first landscape page for this trophy. Got it. And inevitably get all the landscape paintings in the first area for this trophy. Oh, cool. There are some cool miscellaneous trophies, like this one for listening to a genie sing. Bravo. Yeah, good job. I honestly thought this game was pretty good. It wasn't as bad as I originally thought, and I did end up enjoying it towards the end. I will say though, it was kind of slow moving at the start of the game, so there isn't much to talk about other than the bullies that are constantly chasing you throughout the game. I did like the aspect of 100% in a level though. You have to paint all the lights in an area to get rid of the corruption, and this ends up unlocking a masterpiece. These are basically the same as genie moments, but on a much bigger scale. And once we completed the first one, I got a trophy. Is that what you're picturing? In the next area, I grabbed all the genie and feature pages for the trophy Every Possible Look. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of trophies related to drawing a certain thing on the wall and having the genie react to it. I got a few throughout the game, like this one, for watching a genie talk into a storm lily. I ended up grabbing the majority of these genie specific trophies post game, as you will see shortly. I forgot to record this, but throughout the game you can find newspapers that are placed in each area. After grabbing the last one in the sewers, the trophy popped. For this trophy, I had to play peekaboo with a genie. I actually got this one accidentally while going for the trophy Sugar Rush. But if you interact with a genie here, Ash will hide and play peekaboo. To unlock this trophy, the genie will then pop out a little while after, essentially playing peekaboo with you instead. Ah. You really got me that time, buddy. We can then complete another masterpiece in the sewers before the game gets a bit more interesting. <laughs> so, what do you think? Essentially, the corruption spreads throughout Ash's drawings. Once they come to life, each drawing takes one of the buddies and holds him for ransom. Ash decides that after all the years of bullying he has dealt with, he still wants to help them, so we now have to free each bully from their kidnappers. We start off this section in a tutorial type scenario, where the game teaches us the fighting mechanics. After defeating the minions in the lighthouse, this trophy pops. When freeing the bullies, you also have to tame the rogue drawings by inching forward at just the right time in order to cure the corruption. Then we can free the first bully for this trophy. Uh, 
What just happened? This segment is pretty much a rinse and repeat of taming the drawings and freeing the remaining bullies. But once everyone is free, we can make our way to the final boss fight of the game. To defeat the Dark Alpha Genie, there are three crystals that must be destroyed. It was a pretty easy fight, but in all fairness, this is a kid's game, so it wasn't going to be soul crushing. After defeating the Genie and earning this trophy, the game was pretty much over, and that meant it was finally time for a bit of a cleanup. The easiest way to grab all of these miscellaneous trophies was to unlock Luna's secret area underneath the lighthouse. This unlocks a massive empty room with unlimited space to paint, which is just what we needed to get this platinum. I won't show all of these trophies as they're pretty much along similar lines, but I'll still show you a few of them. I got four of these miscellaneous trophies back to back, starting with the trophy Pyromaniac for painting more than 10 campfires in a row. I then painted 10 moons in a row for this trophy. And then I painted 30 mushroom vines for this trophy. And finally, I painted 20 black birches for this trophy. As you can see, they're sort of all the same trophies, so after earning the majority of them, I only had three trophies left. For the trophy in the zone, I had to paint for three minutes consecutively. This was actually pretty easy. After figuring out that the neon light brush doesn't stop painting, this meant that you can just hold the trigger down for the trophy. All that stood in the way for the platinum trophy was a trophy called Freestyle. This trophy requires you to paint in all four free paint levels. It was easily manipulated by loading into the level, painting one thing, and then saving before repeating three more times to finally earn the lovely platinum trophy. I finished Concrete Genie at 2.44 p.m. And honestly, I probably could have started another game, but I was quite content with the progress I had made and decided to call it a day. This day was one of those days that had me occupied from start to finish. And luckily for us, that meant that The Walking Dead could finally be worked on. I completed the remainder of episode two, watching Kenny drop a salt lick on Larry and deciding to beat Andrew to the ground for the crimes he had committed. This episode ends in a split group decision, deciding whether to take the food from the abandoned car or leave it for the original owners. I chose to leave the food, but it doesn't really matter because Kenny takes the food anyways. 2.06 p.m. I had finished episode two and decided to head straight into episode three. After the group leave in the RV, a pretty big argument kicks off. The game chooses to rectify your split decision from episode one, eliminating Carly out of nowhere. The fuck's the problem? This is the classic illusion of choice, because no matter who you choose to save in the first episode, they end up logged out of life on the side of the road anyways. I chose to leave Lily behind, hoping she'd be eaten alive by the dead. Again, this decision doesn't really matter, because she comes back in season 4 anyway. I'm not the biggest fan of this episode, I must admit. Feels like one long chore, trying to get the train started, but eventually, the train gets moving, and we figure out that Clementine has been talking to some Randy on the walkie-talkie. Can't wait for you to get to Savannah, Clementine. I got your parents right here, and you be sure to find me whether Lee wants you to or not. At 8.24pm, I completed episode 3 and decided to take a bit of a break before coming back at 12am to start episode 4. This episode was pretty good and doesn't really feel like a chore to get through. I think episodes 1, 4 and 5 are my favourites, but I'm sure you all have your own favourite episodes too. This episode starts off with Chuck losing his limbs to save the group and Kenny having flashbacks from losing his entire family in a single second. Eventually we break into Crawford for a battery and once we grab that, we can make our way back to the boat. This is pretty much where things go sour and Clementine gets stolen. It's also where we witness the beginning of the end as Lee gets bit while grabbing Clementine's hat. Oh. 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 No. I completed episode 4 at 4am and as per usual, I decided it was time to get some rest before starting day 9. The morning of day 9 was spent finishing The Walking Dead. As I mentioned before, episode 5 is one of my favourites from the first season because it's just so memorable. The whole episode is pretty much dedicated to finding Clementine, but first we have to deal with the bite. The group decides that Lee's arm should be cut off just in case there's any chance of surviving the bite. A little bit later, Kenny gets all heroic and decides to sacrifice himself to save Ben. This leads you to believe he's dead, but somehow he comes back in season 2 all alive and well. We can make our way through the crowds of zombies before ultimately watching one of the saddest cutscenes in the game. I'll miss you. Me too.
I finished The Walking Dead at 12.28 p.m. I tried to record the Platinum Trophy, but my camera didn't really want to focus at all, so this is the best I got. I honestly love the Telltale games, and even on Vita, this is such a great experience. I'm probably going to go back and Platinum the rest of the seasons on my PS5, because after playing this, I want to experience the whole story again. I decided that because I had plenty of time to spare, I would start the 9th Platinum. I had two options going into this. The 9th Platinum would either be Spyro 2 or The Order 1886, and I ultimately decided to play The Order. The reviews on this game are absolutely terrible. I remember when this game dropped and everyone kind of bashed it and that led to many people, including myself, skipping the game and forgetting about it entirely. I still thought it was worth giving it a shot because sometimes a game will surpass its criticism and that should be pretty good. And I found this to be the exact case with the order. I will admit it did start off pretty slow and at the start I had absolutely no clue what was happening. But as the game progressed, I got progressively more and more involved with the story and it actually turned out to be one of the better games in the challenge. The only trophies you get for playing the game is literally for completing the game which means that there was pretty much no trophies earned during the first playthrough. There are a few collectibles in this game and the first one we come across are objects. One of the trophies requires you to inspect all objects but unfortunately the game doesn't really have any collectible tracker at all so it's kind of a 50-50 chance on whether you grab them all or miss them all. The next type of collectible within this game are newspapers. Again, these are scattered all over the game but cannot be tracked. The final collectible is called a cylinder and surprisingly, for some reason, these are the only collectibles that are tracked so I knew whether I'd miss one or not. A few hours into this game, I found a pretty cool collectible sitting on the cabinet. The main premise of this game is to seek out half-breeds. They transform between being human and being flesh-hungry monsters. There's a pretty cool scene later on in the game where you actually encounter one of these half-breeds. There were two missions that stood out to me in this game and both were stealth missions. The first stealth mission of the game was probably the turning point for me as it was actually pretty good. I actually found the graphics in this game to be pretty up to par with the current gen of games. And what surprised me the most is that this game came out eight years ago. The whole aim of this mission is to save the higher ups from basically getting blown up. This doesn't go super well and eventually we end up in a standoff with the attacker. You don't have to do this. Mallory, the guy who was in the standoff, gets logged out of existence and the next chapter is spent grieving the loss of a friend. In response to his loss, Galahad, who is like your character, decides to seek revenge on the attackers and goes absolutely crazy, blowing everything up in his path and eventually holding this innocent guy for ransom. Where's the Indian woman? Where is she? <laughs> Where is she? Where? Tell me! Tell me! What chapel? There's a good amount of miscellaneous trophies in this game. I mean, in fact, the majority of the trophy list is miscellaneous. I managed to grab a few while playing for the story. Like this one, for stunning an enemy 30 times with a certain weapon. Or this one, for shooting a grenade out of the sky while in black sight mode. The woman that we originally wanted to get revenge on eventually explains that the knights, which is like the group that you're in, are actually corrupt and the higher individuals are half-breeds themselves. Originally, this doesn't sit too well with Galahad, but he decides to see it for himself. So we start the second stealth mission in the game. This is where the game got extremely interesting for me, as we were tasked with finding information linking the knights to the half-breed scandal. It's here that we can find the last object for the trophy, Power of Objection. We can then continue making our way through the garden, brutally ending a few lives before witnessing the truth about the knights. Lord Hastings. Do you believe me now? He is the one behind all this. Lord Hastings calls to the knights and turns the whole situation around on us. This ultimately ends in a court trial to which everyone finds us guilty of conspiring to kill the Lord. Guilty. 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 We end up in prison but eventually get out and are able to collect the last newspaper for this trophy. And then, a little later on, we can collect the last cylinder for this trophy. Nicola! 
There was one trophy that was worrying me throughout the whole entire playthrough, and it was called Well-Rounded. For this trophy, you have to eliminate an enemy with every single weapon in the game. It sounds pretty simple, but I spent the whole time worrying about missing a weapon or not finishing the enemy off before leaving the area. I genuinely got pretty lucky on this one and managed to earn the trophy. I then earned the trophy for inspecting all photographs in the game, and I can't lie, I thought these counted towards the object trophy, so I didn't think it was necessary to record them, which is my bad. This also popped the trophy for Inspector First Class, which is for inspecting all items. All that I had to do now was to end the corruption once and for all by eliminating one of the main half-breeds in the Knights. This was actually a really good fight. It was a lot more impactful if you actually play the game because the half-breed is someone who you could originally trust for the majority of the game. I think that's what makes this ending a lot harder because the game forces your hand and you have no choice but to finish what you started. There wasn't much left to do at this point, it was purely miscellaneous trophies left. I loaded into one of the earlier chapters, which automatically spawned me in with a thermite rifle. I basically spent 5 or so minutes just burning these poor individuals before the trophy popped. I see that. Another trophy I unlocked was called Marksman. This trophy requires you to headshot 5 enemies in black sight mode. I unlocked this accidentally, so I must have grabbed the 4 headshots throughout my playthrough before finishing off this guy to get the 5th. And then finally, for the lovely Platinum Trophy, I had to eliminate one last enemy without aiming. I woke up on day 10 feeling extremely happy that the worst of the challenge was behind me. I only needed a single Platinum Trophy for the challenge to be over and I knew exactly what game I was going to play. I had played the first Ratchet & Clank a few years back and when Rift Apart was released, I purchased it and never got around to playing it. I decided it was best to end this challenge off on a high note, so I quickly got to work platinum in the game. One of the first trophies we get is for entering a pocket dimension. These are basically rifts that contain small explorable areas for new armor. Hi, smarty bot. This is also the same area where we unlock a trophy for equipping a full set of armor. After this, there's a pretty cool boss fight that requires you to jump on a Seekerpede's back and hit it three times before you can finally take it down for the achievement. By the way. On the next planet, I found the first of many Krager bears. These are one of the collectible types in the game, and they can be quite hard to spot on certain planets. <laughs> Think I'd be used to that by now. Thanks for As it has been with the majority of games on this list, there are a decent amount of miscellaneous trophies within this game, the first of which I earned for turning on this jukebox. It was then time to collect the first gold bolt of the game. Unlike the 2016 reboot, Rift Apart doesn't actually require us to collect all 25 bolts and instead only requires 5 bolts for a separate trophy we can earn a bit later on. <laughs> on the planet Sargasso, there is a collectible type called Zerp Stones. For collecting 10 of them, we can unlock this trophy. There's also a few weapon related trophies like this one for fully upgrading a weapon. Again. Unlike the 2016 reboot, this game only requires you to upgrade one weapon, instead of all of them. Ooh, that is practically bursting with power now! A little while later, we can collect the first of 10 spy bots, which will be used for something a bit later on. <laughs> this is when we can finally collect the 5 gold bolts needed for the trophy Nook and Cranny. There are also these little mainline side quest type missions with this little spider bot named Glitch that Ratchet uses to eradicate the viruses within certain levels. There are five levels where Glitch is used and when completing the last one, the trophy pops. There's another cool boss fight here with the undead Grunther, which unlocks the trophy, no bones about it. Before making it to the end of the game, we have to defeat both Dr. Nefarious's. And honestly, <laughs> this was kind of hard. The boss fight went on for so long and there was barely any ammo spawning to actually do any damage. Eventually though, I got past the first part of the boss fight, only to realize that there was more. We have to shoot Emperor Nefarious's heart and this causes the giant robot he's camping in to explode. I actually thought this was the end of the game, but luckily for me, I had to defeat Nefarious one more time. This was the part that kind of took me a few tries. As I mentioned before, there was barely any ammo and the health boxes were basically non-existent. Once I had managed to defeat Nefarious, all the rifts closed and the alternate versions of the characters said their goodbyes. This was when the final trophy of the main game popped. <laughs> Thank you.
All that was left to do now was to clean up the last few miscellaneous trophies. I grabbed the remainder of the spy bots. One of these spy bots requires you to collect the remainder of the Zerp stones. After I grabbed all these spy bots, I could then purchase the Rhino for this achievement. I also went out of my way to grab every single Krager bear. And honestly, without a guide, these would be impossible to find. I had to head back to Sargasso one last time to turn on Rivet's TV for this trophy. And also to eliminate five Grunthers for this achievement. There was only one trophy that really had me worried throughout my playthrough, and that was Shifty Character. To earn this trophy, you have to hit every crystal in Blizzard and Cordelion. This was something I wasn't too sure I had achieved, but I got really lucky and found the last few crystals for the trophy. The hardest trophy in this game had to be Return Policy. This trophy requires you to eliminate 10 enemies by returning shots using the Void Reactor. Now, what is the Void Reactor you may ask? This is an upgrade for the Void Repulsor, and it requires you to level the gun up to level 5. This took me hours. I hadn't used this weapon once due to how bad it was. I decided to just farm the arena and after, no exaggeration, maybe an hour or so of straight replaying this fight, I finally got to level 5. Now the hard part was out of the way, I just had to reflect bullets of 10 enemies and just hoped it would hit them in the right spot. Now that the worst was out of the way, the only trophy standing in the way of the platinum was fully stacked, which requires you to purchase all weapons. This, for some reason, was made super easy by the game's choice to give you free weapons in New Game Plus. So I bought the last few weapons in my base save, headed on over to New Game Plus, and bought the last two weapons for the all and final 10th platinum trophy. So yeah, I managed to complete this challenge and I actually had a lot of fun doing so. Here's the proof that I actually did do this in 10 days. As you can see, the first trophy was earned at 11.17 a.m. on Friday the 13th of January. And the platinum trophy you just saw me earn was earned at 2.37 a.m. on Monday the 23rd of January. I actually still had around eight hours before this challenge was officially over. So I would definitely call that a success. I think the game I had the least fun with would definitely be the medium. It was pretty boring and I just didn't really enjoy playing through the game. Now there's two games that really stood out to me and are what I consider the best games on this list. Jack and Daxter and The Order 1886. Both of these games had me really wanting more from the story. I'm excited to give Jack 2 a go when I have some spare time, but on the other hand, I'm kind of sad to see that there isn't a sequel to The Order because in my opinion, it really does deserve a second game. If you've made it to the end of this video, thank you so much. I appreciate this video is definitely on the longer side, but I didn't want to half-ass this video with two minute coverage of each game. So I decided to make it a bit longer than usual. I also wanted to say thank you for the support recently. This channel was on 1.4 thousand subscribers and my previous video is now on 300k, which is just absolutely crazy. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more challenges like this in the future, be sure to let me know in the comments below. But for now, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye bye.